Uh, welcome everyone. I'm Irán Puebla, part of the uh, conference organizing committee. So welcome to this session. And if you were just in the other aligning talks, uh, lovely to see you here. And thank you for doing the Zoom hoping that I've been doing as well. Um, I just want to briefly check that we have the speakers. I see Valentina, lovely to see you, Valentina. Thank you, Lucia. Good morning. I also see Nina and I'm just going to check if we have Nikesh, who is the fourth speaker for the session. Um, right, while we let everyone uh, join, uh, again, some of them may, be, may have been here in the fantastic uh, presentations we had just now. I'm just going to do the, the brief intro for the session and do the usual housekeeping. Thank you for being part of the conference. Um, again, our thanks to the uh, sponsors for the FORCE 2023 conference. This wouldn't happen without them, and we are very grateful. A reminder that we are recording the sessions, and we are going to be making the recordings available uh, after the conference. And again, if you need any information about the program uh, and which Zoom session to go to, do head out to SHED. Uh, we have all the updated information uh, there, and you may have seen this as well, but we have just open registrations for FISCI, the program with courses uh, that will be happening in the summer. So also encourage you to take a look at the website. Right, with that, we have uh, four uh, lining, lining talks in this session. Uh, everyone was fantastic in the previous one with the timekeeping, um, but hopefully in this one we, we'll have some time for questions. Um, I think I'm going to try the same thing as earlier, which I didn't almost have to do, uh, which was to mention to the speakers that if I see that you're getting a bit tight on time, I'm going to put the clock emoji <laughs> on my Zoom, just to give you a hint. I'm sure there won't be any need, but you know, I'm trying this um, uh, to try to keep us on time. Uh, okay, so we're going to be going in the order that we had in the program. So if I have my information right, the first speaker in this session will be uh, Lucia Lofrenda, and she's Senior Associate Consultant at Research Consulting, where she works on different projects across scholarly communication, open science, and international development landscapes, working with stakeholders such as universities, associations, public bodies, and publishers. So without further ado, over to you, Lucia. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'll just share my, my slides with you. Can everybody see my screen? Uh, it's not coming up yet. Is this OK? Yes, beautiful. Go ahead. OK, great. So thank you. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to talking you, to you today about the Open Access Journals Toolkit. So that's an initiative that will be launched later on in 2023. So I would just like to start really by answering a question that everybody is probably wondering, which is what exactly is the Open Access Journals Toolkit? Um, so I suppose in one very quick sentence, we could sum that up as a free to access resource for anybody looking to develop or manage an open access journal. So the toolkit itself will actually be hosted online. So it's a website and it will include seven, several different pages of content. And the idea is that each page of the toolkit will provide people or users with um, information and guidance across very different aspects of the journal development or management process. So we can think about it as an online resource. Now, I should also mention the toolkit is being developed by OASPA, so that's the Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association and the DOAJ, um, the Directory of Open Access Journals. And we are supporting that development as well at Research Consulting. So together, we really hope that the resource will be able to support uh, an increasingly diverse range of users, I suppose, that um, might need this type of resource. So just to give you a bit of an idea of what exactly the toolkit will cover, I wanted to put on the slide um, really our expected table of contents of the toolkit um, that is currently being developed. So as you can see, the toolkit will cover um, a variety of different topics across the journal development lifecycle. So we've started this from creating an open access journal, and in here you'll find topics and pages around how to choose a journal title or how to define the scope of your journal. Um, you can also find information on uh, looking for kickoff funding, for example. 
Then in terms of managing an open access journal, there are another set of things that um, managers might need to think about. Um, for example, information on running costs, like covering your staff costs and other fixed costs, um, information on publication frequency, and also flipping journals to open access. Then under indexing and dissemination, we provided content on journal indexing, as you'd imagine, and um, article discovery. We also have a dedicated section on staffing and recruitment. So that will include how to recruit journal staff and choose the right members for your editorial board, and even some topics on training and staff development as well. Um, as you might expect, there's also quite a lot to cover under policies. So we've included information on how to develop the right author guidelines, um, comply with funder policies and understand copyright and licensing just for a start. And then finally, we have a section on technical considerations, which will help people to consider things such as DOI registration and all the way through to the software and technical requirements that you might need to consider if you're setting up a, a, an open access journal. So that's a very quick overview, but hopefully it does give you an idea of the kind of content that we we cover. Now, when we saw the call for proposals for FORCE 2023, we were really pleased because um, a key point of this year's conference is, is around discussing open, open science and in a more global and local context, and also ensuring that open science becomes a more inclusive dialogue. Um, so we felt like this mission really related to what we've been trying to do with the Open Access Journals Toolkit as well. And we've tried to design all of the content in the toolkit with these aims in mind. Um, so the idea is that the, the resource can really serve a very diverse range of users from all, all countries, territories, languages, etc. So as a starting point for this, we're really keen to ensure that all of the content on the toolkit will be um, free to access. So that includes anything that's on the pages of our website and also the resources that we link out to. As well as that, we've also been trying to make sure that the website is developed in a way that's suitable for people to use in regions with low bandwidth. So we're trying to make sure that nobody's excluded from usage as far as we can do. Um, secondly, we wanted to ensure that the toolkit content is also relevant to a very diverse range of users. Um, so to do this, OASPA and the DOAJ work together to ensure that the editorial board also represents a range of territories, languages, publisher sizes, etc. So I'll talk about the editorial board a bit later on, but it's quite a diverse group. And then finally, because we'd like to recognize the value of having scholarly outputs in a variety of different languages, especially beyond uh, English, um, we would like to launch the toolkit in multiple different languages. So at the toolkit's launch, which will be in June or July in 2023, we'll release the, the website in English, but then also in French. And then beyond that, we plan to translate the, the website into the other United Nations languages. So that will be Spanish, Russian and Chinese as a start. Um, but going forward, we really hope that the toolkit can be translated into as many different languages as possible. So I think another key question you might be asking yourselves, I suppose, is why? Um, why go to all of the effort to develop such a, a big resource like this? Um, and I think that looking at the current landscape of open access journals can help us think about that and really see the value in this kind of resource a little bit more. So um, I think if we take the journals, for example, that are listed on DOAJ at the moment, so this was these numbers are correct as of yesterday. Um, you can see how many journals are currently in existence and just how many countries and languages they represent. So currently the DOAJ lists 19,222 journals and these represent 131 different countries. Just taking the top six of those countries in terms of the number of journals, we have Indonesia, the UK, Brazil, the US, Spain, Poland and Iran. So already that is just six of the top countries in the DOAJ and we represent five global regions already and probably a whole range of different languages. So if we consider this kind of growth in journal numbers that comes from all over the world, 
I think it's really important that journal managers have some awareness of best practices and some support for them to develop while they're all maintaining the diversity as well. And for us, I think it was also very, very obvious that not many of these journals we see represented on the slide would be supported by big and well-established publishers. And many of them will actually be local journals or journals supported by institutions with much smaller budgets. So it was very important that these um, that our resource is able to support them as well. Um, so yeah, the, the OA Journals Toolkit really aims to address this gap, I suppose, to provide some support for emerging journals specifically to develop. Um, and of course, the toolkit will also be um, available to more established journals too, um, because we think it would also help to them to navigate, I suppose, the, the landscape of open access that is always changing. So really the point is that um, I suppose that the OA Journal Toolkit is really just a resource to help provide journal editors and managers at various different stages um, with a signposting tool that will hopefully make their lives easier. And just to think a little bit further ahead, um, I think another thing I'd like to highlight is the fact that the, the OA Journals Toolkit will be a community-led initiative. So although the um, OASPA and the DOAJ have funded the resource initially and have managed the creation of the toolkit, the actual content is being written up at the moment by this um, editorial board that you can see on the screen. So that's 12 individuals um, on the slide and they all represent such a range of different countries and languages as well. So the idea has been that each each expert writes up certain pages of the toolkit and then there's a process of peer review within the group to ensure that the topics don't just cover one perspective. Um, yeah, there's a range of different voices in each of the sections as well. So I suppose from now until the toolkit is launched later in the year, so in June or July, the development of the content is going to continue in the hands of the, the expert editorial board. So I'd like to thank all of them for their help in putting this together. And beyond that, we just hope that the toolkit will continue to be a resource that's updated by the community and for the community. So with that, I think I'd just like to end my talk and you can feel free to get in touch if you have any questions or you'd like to be uh, kept up to date with the toolkit's launch. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lucia, for this wonderful overview of your toolkit and fantastic work to support open access, again, with broad diversity. Um, as I mentioned on the chat, if anybody has any questions at any point, including about Lucia's presentation, please do add to the chat. I'm hoping there will be time at the end for questions, but again, useful to have those at any point, and I invite the speakers as well to engage to the chat as questions come up. We are going to be moving to the second speaker, uh, Valentina Gasque. Valentina is a master's degree student in neuroscience from Uruguay. She is also an eLife ambassador uh, with an interest in transparency in academia and has been working uh, with the ECR Central Organization to foster a community of early career researchers. So take it away, Valentina. And I cannot yet hear you. I don't know if um, you yes. may need to unmute. Perfect. Sorry, yeah, sorry. No worries. Go ahead. Um, so can you see my screen? Yes, it's coming up. Go go ahead. Okay. So, well, hello, everyone. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about e ECR Central, which is a central platform for the early career research researchers community. So we propose this lighting talk here because we think that it aligns really well with the, um, the spirit of the conference, which is to think and talk and take action both in the global and in the local communities. So let me just start my presentation by going over some of the, um, oh, sorry. Should, uh, well, there. So what are some of the barriers for early career researchers? Maybe this is not any news for most of you, but um, we can talk about like uh, three pillars of, the, of, the, of these barriers. And these are the ones that uh, ECR is going to try and take down. So first we have the, the funding and travel grants. Um, I think that this is the more evident perhaps because it presents a barrier to 
directly to our work, but we also have uh, issues with training and career development and even more so, but less talked about the community research culture, mental well-being, sustainability, policy and engagement, and so on. But I wanted to focus a little bit more about the local communities because all of these issues are heightened when we think about the, the local communities. And what I mean by a local community could be anything from a lab to a whole country. It actually depends on, on where you are from and uh, what you're working on. But I think that one point that we wanted to make uh, about local communities is, is that we usually reinvent the wheel instead of learning from successful initiatives or ideas elsewhere. And I think that this is um, even more um, happening, even more so in developing countries such as my own. So I think that we could really benefit from the global community in this sense, but also the global community could benefit from, from the local experiences, right? But I wanted to make uh, give you a little piece of uh, information here that is specifically for developing countries. So Parello et al. in 2020 found that scientific production is proportional to budget, which is no news, right? It's pretty, um, uh, we can think about that. But then he found that uh, Latin American countries have a tenfold less budget than European countries. And what I want to emphasize with this is that Yes, we have to talk about uh, community and we have to build the best science practices, but we also have to bear in mind that in some countries, such as my own, we have a, a previous barrier, which is the funding barrier. So being able to build bridges between us and the, the other communities is great because we can access information about other uh, international grants or international funding opportunities that maybe could uh, allow us to do better science, right? So, and having said all of this, uh, I wanted to share with you what ECR Central is. So it was set up in 2018 by ELIFE ambassadors uh, before me. So, and it aims to bring early career researchers together to discuss funding opportunities, share experiences and create impact through community engagement. So, um, but what it actually is, is a website and here's a screenshot for you. Um, uh, this is how it works. It is already running. Uh, we have the, the three pillars that I was uh, telling you about before. We have the funding and as of today we have 662 funding opportunities and 104 travel grant opportunities and if you go there you, you can find uh, all of them, um, all of the information there and we also have resources which is a curated list of 161 uh, useful resources and we have the community aspect that we are working to relaunch but it would be a forum for us to discuss the different topics of open science uh, mental well-being and all that I mentioned before um, so the cool thing about this is that it is a platform that is created by early career researchers for early career researchers and here's where you find the contribute tab and you can add whatever funding travel grants or resource that you want and ECR Central has a group of moderators that um, curate those lists and then uh, upload them here so and, and this is very easy to do if, if you go to get involved and then uh, you choose, for instance, to uh, add a new funding. So it will show up a form and you can add like the name, description, funder name, and uh, all of the information and then just submit, submit it. But uh, what we wanted to uh, share this here was to um, maybe encourage all of you to participate and to benefit from it, but also to share whatever information you hold here. Uh, about funding, resources, or community uh, in the near future. Um, well, I think that I was pretty quick about this, so maybe then you have <laughs> any, if you have any questions. But yeah, thank you. And we, I, I wanted to thank Christoph that helped me. Um, he couldn't be here today, but he helped me design the slides and prepare for the talk. And we are working together towards relaunching the, um, the ECR Central Twitter and also to the eLife ambassadors and uh, Eilish, who has been a great help. She's the community manager at eLife and she has been a great help in all of my initiatives and our initiatives. So thank you. Thank you so much, Valentina. Fantastic timekeeping, I'm very happy. <laughs>
<laughs> you make, I think you that make I, my I, job easier. So yeah, it's been beautiful. And actually, I didn't have a question, but I'll, I'll post it on the chat. And again, hopefully okay. there will be some time. I hope I, I didn't talk too quickly. You, you've done beautifully. <laughs> okay. thank you thank so you. much uh we'll come to the questions at the end but again if you have any questions now as i've been saying feel free to post on the chat and i also invite the, the speakers to engage in that way if, if you find that useful um right our third speaker is nikesh gosalia uh who works at cactus communications he heads the strategic alliances division working with societies publishers universities and research institutes in north america europe and the uk um, over to you, Nikesh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, just to confirm, can you all see my screen? We can see the screen. Oh, I was going to say, perfect. It's now in presentation mode. Go ahead. OK, perfect. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, yeah, for today's uh, conversation, I'm just going to share uh, a couple of uh, interesting case studies where some publishers and societies uh, are are adopting, I would say, more author-centric uh, approach. Uh, so as we know that the academic landscape is evolving, uh, there was already a lot of content that was available now with the push towards open access. Uh, there is greater content. And then with, uh, with the uh, launch of uh, AI tools like ChatGPT, uh, as we know, there's just going to be more and more content that's going to be released. Uh, there is also not just the journals now, there's preprint archives and other scholarly communication platforms that are available as well. As a result, what's happened is that um, a lot of publishers and societies, including even the authors, have been thinking about how do we make our content stand out, um, considering the fact that there is just so much of uh, content that's available. Uh, so that's one trend. Uh, the other trend that we are uh, clearly seeing is that a lot of funders and even uh, general public is really asking for the real uh, return on, on the taxpayers' money with so much funding towards research. What is the real impact? Can we measure it? Can we really see the benefits of it? And so we are clearly seeing that uh, as a trend. Uh, if I remember correctly, even funders like Wellcome Trust have uh, on, on their website, as part of their policy, they mentioned saying that you know they would be happy to fund uh, uh, value added services so that you know we can just simplify and explain science in a simpler format. Uh, and the third major trend that is happening is that there is change in uh, the consumption patterns. So more and more researchers uh, are, are Gen Z millennials uh, who prefer whether we like it or no, bite-sized content uh, and uh, everyone has extremely busy lives. Uh, so how can we really explain science uh, in, uh, in simpler uh, formats. I think the other big trend that we are also noticing at an overall level is that more and more publishers and societies are clearly focusing on author uh, at, at the center of, of, uh, uh, of their strategic uh, planning. Um, and so, you know, just, uh, just thinking about author-centric approach is becoming more and more important. Uh, so essentially what is happening is with, uh, with uh, the journal subscription model, um, changing uh, and uh, the move towards transformation deals and charging APCs, uh, that has uh, clearly uh, put extra focus on, on, uh, on trying to uh, provide more value added services to the authors. Now, clearly the APC is, is not enough in many cases because there are still a lot of costs that publishers and societies have in terms of running uh, you know, very important processes like peer review. Uh, so there is not much potential to really bundle anything as part of the APC. Uh, so uh, some of the publishers and societies have been looking at creative ways to unbundle this and maybe offer more author, more value to the authors through what we call as an additional layer uh, to the APCs. Uh, so just talking about uh, three innovative solutions, and the first one is essentially uh, you could you could call it just for simplicity, something which is enhanced APC. Uh, so uh, on the right-hand side, you can see um, it, it looks a bit complex, but essentially what we're seeing is that the subscription revenues are going down, uh, the APC revenues uh, you know, are on the increase, but it's, it's barely enough to probably cover a, a cost in, for a lot of publishers and societies. And so there's not much scope to really add uh, any services there. But what we are now seeing is that 
is there potential to unbundle some of these promotional activities from the regular APC and add that as an optional uh, you know, service for the authors. This could take the form of a plain language summary. Uh, it could be an infographic. It could be a short video. It could be a research news story. Um, and so enhanced APC is one option where it is an individualized author service, uh, which is designed to increase the uh, impact, the reach, uh, you know, connect with peers and even outside um, uh, with, with uh, lay audiences. It is, it is uh, an optional service, like I said, so it is not something which every author has to opt in, uh, but uh, the authors who have spent a lot of time on their research, on their paper, think it is extremely important uh, could opt in for that. Uh, it's not just the uh, authors who can purchase uh, this, but there is also the institutes or research funders or maybe a sponsoring organization who can also uh, look at that. Uh, there are automated solutions that are starting to be available for this as well to make sure this can be done on scale. So for example, there is uh, you know, an organization called Mind the Graph who, who does visual abstracts. Uh, they've got more than 80,000 uh, visual abstracts on, in their database uh, and any researcher can create these visual abstracts on the go uh, at a very cost effective uh, you know, price. Uh, for a publisher or society, this could generate incremental revenue in the future. Um, and you know this doesn't have to be necessarily done through the APC itself. Um, just uh, talking uh, very quickly about a couple of uh, case studies. So there was a prestigious US society who decided to uh, look at uh, adding some of these services uh, because uh, there was a clear strategic objective that they had in, in terms of increasing readership uh, and uh, to, to go beyond just uh, publishing a journal article. And so article summaries were added as an optional service. Uh, authors have been opting in for that. And you know, the uptake has been really good. As a result, it also helps uh, you know, the author in terms of uh, promotional activities, but also improves the brand uh, for, the, for the journal or the, for the society. Um, another case where uh, a, a US society opted in to run an experiment with about 30 papers, 15 with infographics, 15 without. Uh, no surprises, uh, the ones with an infographic uh, were cited almost three times more than the ones without. Uh, and we are seeing similar kind of metrics, uh, you know, for altmetric um, and, and just, you know, regular views as well. Uh, using different uh, other formats like videos, uh, the, the trend seems to be same, where uh, in this particular case, uh, the, the publisher received uh, three times more uh, altmetric scores than, and then just uh, you know simple articles. Uh, so clearly there is scope, there is potential uh, to to take the journal article beyond uh, just the point of publication and making it more engaging in a simpler format and and trying to kind of reach out to lay audiences as well. Um, besides these, there is there is clearly um, while while digital and social channels may seem uh, to be uh, kind of upcoming casual mediums, but I think we are starting to see more and more being done through Twitter, through Instagram, through LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, all of these channels. Uh, and I think just creating an infographic or a video is sometimes not in enough. Uh, you need to have a, a very well-planned targeted digital campaign uh, to, to do that. So again, in, a, in cases of a few societies and publishers, uh, we have been working on an end-to-end -end strategy to to, to uh, maybe select a few journal articles or papers based on whatever are the latest themes, uh, identifying the key message out of it, using different formats, and then helping also in terms of doing the actual dissemination, measuring the impact of it, and then you know circling back uh, with uh, say the editorial teams or the marketing teams or PR and communication teams. Uh, so clearly, uh, you know we are seeing this uh, as an emerging trend. And potentially, this is an opportunity to engage uh, with uh, with other authors, with lay audiences, and also uh, potentially looking at creating a new uh, revenue stream uh, for publishers and societies. So with that, that's my last slide. Thank you so much for uh, listening in. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me through chat or, or uh, offline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikesh. I think uh, you raised a few interesting things here in terms of how can we look into the visibility of articles in, in, in new ways. Uh, I, I do a lot of work on, on preprints in my in my work and, and we've seen the importance of social media and you know using different channels to get the, the papers out there. So thank you.
thank you for sharing all of these ideas. Uh, right, we have a four. We have a four line in talk in this session. Uh, our next speaker, so last but certainly not least, is Nina Tseke. Apologies, Nina, if I have mispronounced uh, your surname. Um, Nina works at Science Open, where she is responsible for partner and customer content integration and platform uh, support. Uh, and she's going to be talking about the project that she's been working on. So, Nina, over to you. Hi. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Sorry, thank you for the introduction. We were invited, as uh, already mentioned, here today to talk a little bit about our technological infrastructure in regards to multilingual content support. That's the topic for today. So, however, before we start, um, just a very few words to us. So, we Science Open are a freely accessible open discovery and networking platform built on top of a research database of currently roughly 85 million records, including articles, book, chapters, preprints, proceedings, data sets, reports, and posters. We offer many great features for our uh, user base, sorry, it's, yeah, sorry, for our user base, such as free poster and preprint publication, um, scientific uh, profile curation and synchronization with ORCID, and the option to claim and enhance your own publications as an author. Our business model is based on providing a broad variety of services to publishers, including open access hosting and um, publishing for books and journals. And we provide an open, um, oops, open uh, post-publication peer review structure on all of our content. <clears throat> As such, one of our underlying guidelines and overall driver to building and maintaining the Science Open platform um, has always been the idea of making ac academic content more open. So, of course, in the beginning, this meant mostly trying to aggregate as much of the data out there that is freely available and to keep the content as accessible as is. Um, so that also means, for example, integrating unpaywall from very early on. Consequently, um, also, you don't even have to create an account on Science Open to access any of the main information that we have on the platform. For many years now, we also have had a cooperation with Cielo. So in addition to the open STEM research aggregated uh, from the beginning from the PubMed, PubMed Central and the archives, we built in the entire Cielo database and aggregated the open and multilingual content. So basically from the beginning, we had multilingual content displayed across our platform. So here you see some nice Cielo examples with bilingual English and Portuguese content in this case with the um, translated uh, abstracts and titles in both directions. So you have an English original and you have a Portuguese original here. However, as I mentioned, on top of being a research database and aggregator, we are an interactive researcher platform where authors can create their own profiles, hook up with ORCID, and in turn, those validated authors can then claim their own publications, upload their own list of publications directly from ORCID, and also have access to their own publications to enhance them and add more context, such as keywords and subject, to make their own open metadata richer and better connected for increased visibility. As part of this metadata enrichment, uh, we introduced a few years back our author summaries. Author summaries are one means to add context data to either make your publication accessible uh, for a non-specialist audience. So here you have an example um, of a quick summary in lay terms, basically, or to translate available abstracts into other languages as well. So to open up the research on a global or local dimension. Here you have a nice example from our poster publications where the author added to their English poster about diversity in Malaysian manga, very fittingly a Malay title and abstract. So as this is inputted via a free text field, there is actually no end to the variety of inputs. So you could actually translate an abstract into any local language or even into dialect. So next time you publish, for example, a regional studies, uh, you could think about adding an abstract in a local language or maybe even a dialect. So, or you could also um, write something akin to a preface, uh, providing some background on the why and how of the studies, uh, which is something that is very current um, Common for books, but not uh, for articles, of course. So the next step was then a platform-wide adoption of multilingual support on all of our metadata interfaces. So for quite some time now, we have been offering this option to add translations for titles, subtitles, 
and abstracts as an additional layer of access and content as a default setting. So all publishers hosting a journal or books on Science Open uh, have this option available on all of their content um, or can enable that at least. So this means that authors can also add abstract, um, translated abstracts uh, to their manuscripts during the submission process, such as here, we have an example from the UCL Open Environment Journal that uses a completely open, transparent submission and peer review system, um, where they also simply added a Danish translation, a title translation. Or the authors could add translations themselves, uh, the publishers, I mean, the publishers. So even as an ex post publication option, adding um, multilingual translations to title um, abstracts uh, to all of the back content. Uh, either, and, and in any case, we will make sure that the respective cross records are updated accordingly. So this step is, this step of enrichment is affected not only on Science Open, but beyond. So of course, authors can themselves open up their content to other audience by using the same infrastructure feature and add translated titles and abstracts in addition to already mentioned author summary. So in contrast to this author summary fields, the translation support is structured. So you actually need to select um, your input language from a drop-down menu. Currently implemented languages are based on the International Organization for Standardization, which covers currently 183 languages. Um, so the advantage of having this as a structured input becomes clear when we have here, when looking here, for example, at some Arab or Hebrew examples, um, as the read direction you see on the page is controlled by the language selection and input. So you have, you clearly see here the uh, right, and, uh, right and left side aligned content to, uh, text. Of course, the metadata outputted and shared contains the original and translated language attributes as part of the machine readable data. So again, this additional layer of context information is not lost beyond the platform. So lastly, I want to quickly showcase two of our customers' uh, implementation that go even further in terms of making their output more accessible and therefore publishing under a more inclusive strategy. And the first uh, example here is again UCL Press who decided to publish one of their issues in Radical Americas um, as a bilingual issue. So here, not only the metadata, but the full text is translated and published in English and Spanish. For the English original, we have metadata and full text read out onto the HTML page, as you can see here. And for the Spanish version, we have a, a PDF viewer and the translated metadata for the full text. And via here, this uh, simple translate button, you can easily jump back and forth between both versions to quickly access the right one if you land on the wrong language side. So, and this force uh, is always leading you back uh, to the right side. So lastly, currently the most holistic implementation of multilingual uh, publishing and hosting on our platform is very recent addition, Microbiology Independent Research Journal published by Doctrina. Similar to the last setup, this is uh, full text uh, and metadata read out to the HTML page, but in this case, for both um, versions. So um, here you have the English original and then uh, translation in Russian. So the Kyrillic read out onto the HTML in full text, which has the additional uh, advantage, of course, that also the translation is accessible via read, uh, screen reader technology. So visually impaired users can also have access to this full text content. Even more so, of course, if all text is used in the XML data to describe images and tables. So both implementations from UCL and MIR also apply uh, DOIs for the translation. So in this case, suffixes signifying which language version is the translated one, while this connection between either is well documented and registered, of course, as such. So traditionally, uh, of course, academic output is produced in dominant languages, such as English and Spanish, at least in the Western Hemisphere. However, speaking of uh, diversity, um, inclusiveness, etc. Chances are then that we are basically recreating colonial discursive strategies instead of finally overcoming um, a still partly prevalent Eurocentristic academic culture. 
So on the other hand, of course, there is obviously very good reason to publish in dominant languages in terms of reaching widest possible audiences. So publishing or reprocessing also your content even ex post in a multilingual format is a very easy means to make sure research is not reinforcing language barriers and actually hindering uh, access to scientific knowledge as part of cultural knowledge. And therefore, is multilingual publishing is a very suitable strategy to not recreate or maintain hierarchies, but rather build bridges to open up and connect research communities on the one side and civil societies on the other. So to fully realize the potential of accessibility and inclusivity in academia, our technological infrastructure is designed to offer simple solutions to open up the content to global and local audiences. So this is just one of the various ways we can support the publishing industry to also deconstruct hierarchies and reduce access barriers to scientific content. After all, I mean, we live in a multilingual world and research output should reflect that. So that's us. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nina, for this wonderful presentation. I'm such a great supporter of including multilingualism. I grew up in a place with multiple languages. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's very close to my heart. And I'm, I'm glad to see that also now we have the technology that makes this translation so much easier and less time consuming than it used to be. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, right, thanks to all of our speakers. Wonderful timekeeping. We still have 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, I believe I haven't missed anything that I do have some questions, so I'm happy to, to get us started while, while others think about things they may want to uh, ask our forest speakers, or again, if you have comments or, or, or additional suggestions, feel free as well to either post on the chat or, or let me know and you can unmute and, and, and do your reaction or your comment. Um, I'm going to be perhaps going in back order. Yes, what, what, you know, taking advantage of advantage of what's most fresh in my mind. I did have a question for Nina uh, about. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the engagement with the translated content or the content that is posted not in English. Whether you have a sense of, you know, how much engagement you get for the uh content not in english compared to that in english and the other question i had is uh, you mentioned that you also post the uh, transparent reviews which is fantastic and a great proponent of transparency in peer review i just wonder out of curiosity whether you also have reviews in different languages um so i i actually don't know that so starting with the last question i don't know if we have reviews in other languages but we certainly can do that so I think currently we have the, um, the setups we have with journal publishing, for example, journal publishing workflows, where there is an actual peer review happening on the Science Open platform. Um, I think most of those are actually all in English. However, of course, um, and this, this uh, bilingual journal that we last, uh, that I've last uh, demoed, that was Russian English. Um, there, this is only this is has uh, this is only live since uh, a few weeks, so we can't can't really have any we don't have really any statistics on that. Um, in general, what we do what we actually looked at at some point in the past is of course uh, engagement with metadata. So if you increase metadata in the sense of adding abstracts, adding translations, all of this all of this additionally generated data is definitely uh, causing more traffic. So, I've, I'm, but in the end, it's, I think it's quite logic because if you, even if you can't access an article, the more context information that ha you have, the more interesting it becomes for anyone engaging with uh, the research. So, um, and then of course, open access is adding more traffic than non-open access. So, um, but I don't have any, any statistics um, available to say, uh, if you if you publish bilingual or multilingual, then you can expect a certain increase of traffic. I don't know. Um, it certainly increases traffic simply because you reach other audiences, um, but I can't give you any numbers on that. And then lastly, uh, going back to the preprints and reviews. So we do connect. We have setups where we have um, journal publishing with peer review submission 
uh, preprint submission basically, then open peer review on the structure, uh, on, the, on the platform here, for example, this UCL open environment is a beautiful uh, implementation of that. So everything is open, everything is transparent, and everything is connected. So on the article page, no matter where you are on the published version, be it a third version, first version, or a preprint, first submission, um, everything is connected. So you have um, the, the original preprints, then you have the reviews connected, then you can go to the next uh, version. And so it's, a, it's quite, quite well interconnected and transparent. And of course, we register, so Crossroads does support that. We register the DOI, so also the information shared, delivered, contains this interconnection. So, and then just very lastly, because I mentioned this yesterday, um, which is incorrect, so I gave some incorrect information. So we do aggregate the complete PMC, but PMC doesn't have any preprints. So we have all of the archive preprints, but no, none from PMC, so, because it's what it is. So it's, I think, did I cover everything? Yes, you cover everything. And thank you so much. I mean, I, I realize that, you know, it's fine if you don't have numbers. I think it just may be interesting in the future to see um you know what the attention is on the traffic but it makes total sense to me what you were describing and saying as the more you enrich a piece of content you know in different languages more metadata the data associated you know connecting the different it makes sense that there will be more potential reasons why a user will come to it so you, you are just you know enabling that that further access uh wonder, wonderful thank you i just want to check that i'm not missing anybody else's Questions because I have more questions, but you know this is the issue with being the chair of a session like this. Uh, while um, I give more time for uh, again the the attendees to see if the, to to share if they want to ask any questions, I wanted to come back to something I posted on um, on the chat for Valentina, and then I'll come I'll come to this question from Graham. Um, I Valentina, I, I'm. It's great to see all the work supporting early career researchers. I just wonder if you could tell us an apologies if I missed this in your presentation. Again, do, do you only have eLife ambassadors involved uh, behind the ECR Central, or you know, from from where are you drawing support in terms of running the platform? And I also wonder if you have any particular, you know, success stories. I don't know connections that you made, you know, information that was particularly useful to somebody. Um, well, the the. The team that's running the, the platform is uh, composed of eLife ambassadors, but I think that to be a moderator, you don't have to be an eLife ambassador. I'm not sure about that, but I, I don't think so. Um, right now, there are not, no open uh, registration for moderators because we are shifting this uh, to this forum, more community-based uh, um, approach. But um, the moderators, you can see them in the even in the ECR central in the platform, and they are all over the world. But I'm not sure if all of them were eLife ambassadors or not. Fantastic. Thank you. I mean, I think it makes sense, you know, and it's great to see that, that you have different communities involved. It's very important, you know, the 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 experience for early career researchers doesn't doesn't look necessarily the same way in different countries depending on the setting so important to 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 have all of that uh right there was a, a question from graham smith in the chat this is for nikesh uh so in terms of additional value add models beyond the article how much of a challenge do you think there is in measuring and agreeing on metrics for that value assuming it's distinct to existing article uh Base metrics or oh, the perennial question about metrics. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, thank you, Graham. Uh, that's a very relevant question, and uh, I think um, in terms of how much of a challenge it is, a real challenge. To be very honest with you, uh, I what we've noticed is uh, with different personas. So you know, talking about authors or talking about publishers, societies, uh, and within publishers, societies as well, different departments have you know different expectations or different objectives or different vantage points right if from a from a journal from a marketing department point of view they would want to just uh, try and see a number of views uh, from an editorial point of view maybe citations from an author point of view is my paper uh, you know getting enough uh, traction uh, so yes it is challenging uh, and i don't think there is only one set of metrics uh, right now that is um, that is available and and universally accepted by everyone. But I think the best way to kind of look at this is probably that, you know, we kind of 
um, uh, laying down the 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 tracks uh, for uh, for future, and uh, there is increasingly more alignment uh, that we are observing uh, from publishers and societies uh, on uh, on uh, the metrics. So you know, improvement in citation scores, improvement in alt metric, uh, using QDOS as a platform perhaps uh, to uh, to measure this, uh, to to talk to other uh, fellow researchers. I think. Uh, all the different pieces are starting to come together and uh, we are hoping for greater alignment to happen uh, but but definitely it is a, uh, it is a challenge right now graham so you know yeah there's no universal acceptance on just one set of metrics so and in fact i mean what some may raise is that what we want is different metrics and then use them responsibly according to our needs and you know i guess just making sure that they are transparent and we understand what is it that we are measuring etc um, right. So again, we have a, a few more minutes, so feel free to either post on the chat or unmute if you would like to ask a question to any of our speakers. Um, just gonna give it a second so I don't necessarily more, you know, monopolize the microphone by being sure. Um, if there are no questions, I did, I didn't have a, a, another item for you, Nikas. I wonder if you if you will have any. Um, oh, oh, sorry, something just came in. So I'll, I'll, I'll give priority to the audience. Um, write a question for Nikes as well. Um, uh, regarding the enhanced APCs, uh, will this prevent authors who are based in countries with less funding from receiving the benefits of the optional extra features? These authors are less likely to be able to afford the additional fees for a summary infographic, etc. Are there strategies in place to avoid enhance uh, APCs exacerbating the existing inequities? Uh, and this is Emma from me live. And Emma, thank you for raising this. I was gonna, I was about to ask something of a similar line. So, <laughs> Nikas, what advice do you have? Yeah, no, thanks, Emma. I think it's a very relevant question, and and uh, clearly something that uh, that uh, you know we've been thinking about, and and we've in our conversations with some publishers and societies. As well, this this uh, particular topic's been coming up. I think uh, the way to uh, to probably uh, you know look at this is if there is a an element of technology uh, that can assist us to make this more scalable. So, like one example that I was sharing is uh, uh, the typical human uh, effort intensive you know infographics or. Uh, or even visual abstracts can be, you know, quite expensive, uh, right? Because we are involving scientific communicators. Uh, they have to read the paper. They have to kind of extract the key message out of it. But a possibility um, and a more scalable and a more viable option could be uh, one of the solutions that I very briefly spoke about. For example, an organization called Mind the Graph. Uh, so they've got a database of more than eighty thousand visual abstracts. You can pretty much go on their site and say, you know, type neurology, and you'll see a whole set of visual abstracts that will be available to you. And pretty much on the go, you could create a visual abstract which, which meets the purpose. Uh, so you can share that on social media, um, and and you know you're able to communicate the key message. Uh, they do have a variety of options available. It could be subscription based, uh, and I think some of those could cost as low as $15 uh, or $20 uh, to just create a, a visual abstract and communicate your key message. Uh, so yes, I, I agree with you, Emma. I think this has to be more scalable. This has to be more viable. This cannot just be for you know, authors who can really afford this. Um, and I think a, a layer of technology can definitely support. Another organization in the UK called Scholarcy, I think does some work around AI summaries as well. Uh, so. Uh, you know, it could be just extracting a key message. It could be um, be presented along with your paper, and it it does the job for you. So I think that is perhaps the way to go. And maybe more and more, uh, when more of these services become mainstream, uh, hopefully, just with that scale and with that volume, uh, we'll be able to kind of you know do this at uh, at a lower price as well. So I hope that answers your question, Emma. Thank you so much. Uh, interesting that you mentioned artificial intelligence, etc. I was kind of waiting for somebody to mention chat GPT, so I guess it will have to be me. <laughs> but I'm not a great social media person, I have to say. 
Um, and actually, I've been playing with ChatGPT for that purpose to say, actually, can you help me summarize this? Uh, partly because I'm very bad. I, I used to be an editor and tend to write very long sentences and Twitter 280 characters is always a challenge. So, I mean, it's been helping me to a certain degree, you know, it doesn't get everything right. But it's, I, I found that useful in that sense and, you know, make this concise for me. So there are maybe other tools that you know appear also for. I know there are some tools for creating images, etc. So we may see some further advances in in hopefully in tools that make things easy, but also don't don't fall into the pitfalls of you know the biases and potential issues that we know about. Uh, right. So we have a, a very few minutes left. So I guess this is my final call for questions. If anyone has anything, I guess this. Um, type it on the chat or feel free to unmute now and ask the question. Um, otherwise, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a channel on the 4C11 Slack. So if you if you say, oh, actually, the session just finished and this came to my mind, do post questions and comments there. I invite everybody uh, to join the channel and the discussion through Slack. Um, again, we want to keep the conversation going. Um, I see no other items here, so I think that what I can do then, again, if you have anything else that come up, uh, feel free to post through Slack, or you should have seen the contact details for the for the speaker, so I'm happy to share them. Um, the only thing then left uh, before I let you all uh, go on with your activities for the day um, was to mention what's coming next after this. Uh, let me just put up my slide. I think I had something to I reminded myself what I need to say. Um, so yes, very briefly, there should be a break now um, coming up in the program, but we have a workshop, which is the next session. If my counts are right with the time zones, it should start in a couple of hours. Uh, this is a workshop hosted by Sebastian Karsha, uh, talking about getting data cited. We had a lot of talks today about open data and giving credit and how to make that visible, et cetera. So hopefully this will be of interest to many of you. Uh, I posted the details there. Everything is on shed. So do join the workshop if you are interested and otherwise uh, the remainder of the sessions will be happening a bit later in the day. Again, all of the program is on shed for your information. If you have any questions or need any help uh, at any point, do again contact us also through the uh, Force 11 Slack. We have a help desk channel specifically for that. Uh, so do post any questions or issues there. Okay, and with that, I'm going to thank again our speakers. Thank you everyone for sharing all the great work that you're doing and your insights on different aspects of scholarly communications. It's been great hearing about your work. Thank you also for, to all the audience for being here and for the, the questions and engagement. And um, with that, I'll let you go on to your activities and look forward to seeing you in future sessions of the conference. Thank you so much. Bye for Thank now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.